When was the last time that you can remember that you were really, really hungry? I mean, not just regular hunger, you were starving. And everything you tried didn't seem to actually satisfy that hunger. In fact, maybe we could call this the Hunger Games. In fact, I would like to play you the trailer for the new Hunger Games movie that is coming to an organization near you. This happens to be Scott. <laughs> and Scott is really, really hungry, and unfortunately, he is acting out his hunger with his boss, Emily. So I want you to listen in and see if you can figure out and detect what might cure Scott's hunger. Let's listen in. So, we're gonna get this done, right? Oh yeah, yeah, without question, without a doubt. It's not gonna happen. You mentioned the 18th, I'm thinking worst case scenario, we are good to go afternoon of the 17th. Great. Not true. I think we'll involve the design team right away. Good. These are people uh, filled with creativity. They have zero ability to get this done. They love pressure. They thrive on it. I've heard a lot of good things from them about pressure. I have literally had death threats, uh, verbal, written, implied, tacit, but we'll have it done on time, under budget, budget. <laughs> and uh, minimal resources. <laughs> uh, you're a visionary. Truly, she couldn't lead her way out of a soaking wet, perforated paper bag with instructions written on the bag. Yes, no, absolutely, this is not an issue at all. There literally in the history of civilization has never been any project team of any size, shape, budget, form, or level of intelligence that could pull off something of this magnitude. It's gonna be amazing. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, well, let's get to it. Wow, maybe Scott just needs a Snickers bar. You know the saying, you're not you when you're hungry. You've all seen the Snickers commercials, okay? Or maybe this is actually beyond a Snickers bar. Maybe what Scott is really looking for is actually something different. In fact, maybe this is a common symptom of a different kind of hunger the hunger for truth. In fact, Vital Smarts just recently released some research where it became clear that this hunger for truth may be reaching epidemic proportions. It showed that managers in performance reviews didn't have a tough time sharing honest information all the time with their direct reports, but that direct reports, 80% of the time, these direct reports recognize glaring flaws in their manager, which they talk about to everyone but the manager. So how do we satisfy this craving for corporate truth? What new 21st century leadership theorem could we pull up that would be the key to this complex uh, puzzle? Now, if you were to go to Amazon Books today, and you were to go to the section and put in for a search leadership, Amazon would populate over 57,000 books that have the word leadership in it. So how do we actually formulate this, push it all away and get back to the basics of what is actually good leadership? And maybe we should take a little cue from the movie Sound of Music. How many of you have ever watched The Sound of Music? And you know what Maria said, let's start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. Okay, that's enough, that's enough, thank you. <laughs> and I promise that I will keep my day job here. <laughs> yeah, what is the, basic of, the basis of leadership? Now, interestingly enough, I was reading through some wisdom literature, some Hebrew wisdom literature a number of months ago, and I came across what I believe is perhaps the essence of good leadership, some of the first laws of leadership. And here is what I discovered. 
is that great leaders do three things. They do justly, but while they're doing justly, they are also loving mercy and they also walk humbly. And in fact, we might actually call this the triangle of truth. So in an attempt to better understand this, let's take apart each of these sections, but you need to know that they don't work independently, they work synergistically, supporting, modifying, clarifying the truth. So let's go to the first one here, wise leaders do justly. I want you to note the word do. In my experience, sometimes leaders just fail to do something in a timely manner. Now, I don't know whether you know this, but the number one brand slogan in the world, do you know what it is? Just do it. Just do it. Okay. Now, if you take those three words, though, and you scramble them in a little different manner, you will get do it just or do it justly. So what do we mean by justly? Look at the traits here. Uh, impartially, correctly, reasonably. But the one that jumps out to me is truthfully. Can I find a way to do this truthfully? This is the first behavioral imperative, to do justly. But there is some information out there that may be challenging this. In fact, Every year, the Oxford English Dictionary picks a word of the year, a word that is Googled more than any other word, and a word that tends to represent a picture of society. I want you to turn to your table mates. You have 10 seconds. What do you think the word of the year in 2016 was? Real quickly, turn to your table mates. What do you think the word of the year was? All right, here we go. And the word of the year is, little drum roll, okay, is post-truth. How many of you got it? Not a lot of people. Actually, this word goes back to 1992, but in 2016, the percentage of it being Googled went up by 2,000%. Now, what does post-truth mean? Here's the definition of post-truth. Relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influ influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Now, interestingly enough, Abdu Murray has written a really great book, and he describes that whenever you have this existence of post-truth as a concept, it actually creates a culture of confusion. And this culture of confusion actually can be translated into a couple of forms here. There is a soft culture of confusion, and here we acknowledge that truth exists, but we are more influenced by our subjective thoughts and feelings. Now, how do you compare this and contrast the soft mode of truth with the hard mode of truth? In this mode of truth, we are willing to disseminate false premises on the basis that it will reach a noble end. But the challenge here is that if you continue down this road of soft and hard, it can eventually end in something called a confabulation. It's a lie told honestly. Now, the point is, is that we're all exposed to post-truth. We are all exposed to this culture of confusion. Let me tell you a story that takes this culture of confusion and pulls it in. 
This is a story from my coaching days in college, which created a culture of confusion and made post-truth very, very inviting. This is the best team I ever coached. We had won eight games out of 10 games. Those two games that we ended up losing, we actually lost in overtime. We were at the end of the semester, and I was hoping that we could go to the big dance, March Madness. I was sitting in my room, my office, when a knock at the door came, and one of my point guards, who's on this picture, said, Coach, do you have a couple of minutes? I said, yeah. He came in and he said, well, I just thought I'd tell you that I dropped a class. I said, you dropped a class? He said, yeah, I couldn't get into uh, physical therapy school unless I had a B in chemistry, and I only had a C, and I wanted to drop the class so that I could retake the class. And I said, well, that sounds reasonable. I said, when did you drop the class? He said, two months ago. I thanked him for the information, and as he walked out the door, I felt this post-truth infection beginning to grab me. I struggled with it. About a half an hour later, I walked over to the administrator's office, and I shared the information to the administrator, and he looked at me, he looked around, and he leaned in towards me, and he said, Stace, you and I are the only ones that know about this. And the culture of confusion began to get worse and worse and worse. I struggled all afternoon, I'm ashamed to tell you. But finally, just thinking came back. And I realized that the only thing that I could do was to call the eligibility committee and to report ourselves. And it caused them great pain, but they called back and said, Stace, you have to forfeit the eight games that you've won for a semester, and that player cannot play the rest of the year. Now, I'm going to tell you that there were a number of forces that helped me to come to a better conclusion here, but I want to share one of them. And I don't know whether you have ever heard of probably one of the best coaches in the NCAA. Let's play a little Jeopardy. The category is great coaches. This coach has the winningest record in the NCAA. Turn to your table mates and see if you know what it is real quickly. The answer is, who is John Wooden? Who is John Wooden? Very good. Now, if you read anything about John Wooden, here's the interesting thing. He doesn't say much about winning. In fact, every year I would give this to my team. They were required to study this. This is called the pyramid of success. And I would point them particularly to his definition of success. Notice here, it says that success is peace of mind that's attained only through self-satisfaction in knowing that you did your best of which you're capable. The other thing that I pointed him, them to was his definition here, or at least his concern about character and reputation. He would define reputation as what people think you are. And character is who you really are. And guess what? In my culture of confusion, I was concerned about my reputation. But when just thinking came, doing justly, it became easier because winning without honor isn't winning. Let's go to the second behavioral imperative. Wise leaders love mercy. So while they do justly, they love mercy. Let's go to uh, some traits of mercy. I love all of these, but the one that sticks out to me the most is the word clemency here, 
which talks about moderation. It talks about balance. So when you're administering justice, do I do this in a way that actually is balanced? It's a balanced approach. Because there are a couple of ways that we can do this. In fact, two differing approaches to the application of mercy here. The first is, I need to love mercy by using natural, not imposed consequences. And you have seen this. We teach this particularly in Crucial Accountability. Um, steps taken to punish, okay, and bribe others. Or, <clears throat> we can love mercy by using natural consequences. Both the good and the bad things that occur as a natural result of people's choices. So let me have you try this out, because here's the interesting thing. Truth always has an enhanced effect when truth exposes error attached to grace. It works much better. So what I'd like you to do right now is I'd like you to think of someone that you struggle with right now, someone who has hurt you, someone perhaps who has done something that you believe justice needs to be applied. Now, if it's at your table, just raise your hand. No, just kidding, all right? <clears throat> do you have that person in mind? With that person in mind, I am going to share with you a consideration statement written by C.S. Lewis. And as I read this statement, and as you read it, I want you to put that person that you have in mind into this equation. Suppose one reads a story of filthy atrocities in the paper, and then suppose that something turns up suggesting that the story might not be quite true or not quite so bad as it was made out to be. And is one's first feeling, thank God, even they aren't quite so bad as that, or is it a feeling of disappointment? And even determination to cling to the first story for the sheer pleasure of thinking your enemies are as bad as possible. And then Lewis says, if it is the second, then it is, I'm afraid, the first step in a process which if followed to the end will make us into devils. Ooh, that cuts a little close, doesn't it? Because I believe that there ought to be justice, natural or imposed. Am I more interested in the person simply changing behavior because of the circumstances that they're beginning to feel because of their own behavior? Or do I feel that justice hasn't been served unless they're punished? Do justly, love mercy. And let's go to the final imperative here. Wise leaders walk humbly. What do we mean by humbly? So how do you carry yourself? Do you carry yourself modestly, respectfully, as you're thinking about other people? You might be interested that there has been some recent research into what characteristics make great bosses, and you know where I'm headed with this. Great bosses, the best bosses, are actually humble bosses. In fact, organizations are actually seeking to hire and promote individuals who have good leadership capability, but who don't seek the limelight. In fact, Hogan has come up with the Hogan Humility Scale that measures how well people highlight what others do, and yet at the same time admit mistakes and they're open to feedback. They call this the H factor. Now, I don't think that you can find a better place to understand the H factor because the best definition that I have ever read or heard of was written by Samuel Rutherford. I'm sure that you recognize his name, okay. I want to read this to you. It is absolutely phenomenal. Humility, he says, has nothing to do with depreciating ourselves and our gifts in, we, in ways that we know to be untrue. Even humble attitudes can be masked for pride. Humility is that freedom from ourself which enables us to be in positions in which we have neither recognition nor importance, neither power nor validity, and even experience deprivation and yet have joy and delight. Notice the last sentence. 
It is the freedom of knowing that we are not at the center of the universe, not even our own private universe. It frees me from me to pay attention to you, which now creates a completely different outcome. Let me explain this with a story. Three months before the election of 2016, I had been doing a session of crucial accountability in Boston. I walked out of my session, I hailed a cab, and when I got into the cab and we took off, I made the mistake of asking him how his day was going. And he told me, uh, you know, the idiots that he had been associated with in his cab over the course of the next last few hours had absolutely no political sense. We have a great opportunity, he said, to do something different here this year. And as we got to the hotel, I hadn't said much. I just said, well, it's a different kind of election. I grabbed my stuff and I went into the hotel. I changed into my running gear and went out across the Boston Common reviewing my day. And I began beating myself up when I got to the cab ride. You should have said something to him, Stace. So I went to the session the next day, finished the session, and I went out and hailed a cab, and would you believe of all of the cab drivers in Boston, I got the same guy. I couldn't believe it. And I thought, well, this is your opportunity. So we're driving back through the uh, back bay, et cetera, and he's going off on you know, his candidate and everybody other's candidate. And he said, we have an opportunity. And I said, you're right, we do have an opportunity, but I think your candidate has some problems. And he immediately turned around and he said, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, let me be clear. I became an independent voter 25 years ago because I don't think anybody has a monopoly on the truth. I have voted for a Republican, I have voted for a Democrat, and against the objection of my wife, I have even voted for an independent. And I said, you may not be aware of the fact that there is some research, some psychological brain research that indicates that you may have the best idea in the world, but the way you deliver that to other people, if it is aggressive, they may not even consider the idea. He turned around and he says, is that true? I said, yeah, it is. We had a great conversation. I get out at the curb, gather my belongings, I'm headed to the hotel, and he slides over to the passenger side and he yells out at me, hey, mister, do you have a business card? I said, yeah. I came back over, handed him the business card, he looked at it and he said, hey, would you mind if I called you over the next couple of months before the election so that we could talk about things? I said, I'd love it. Now, here's the thing. I realized that I was given a second chance. And I was given a second chance primarily to hear someone else's story. And all of a sudden, the wisdom of the Quaker maxim made sense to me. And you may have heard this, but the maxim is, an enemy is one whose story we have not heard. And the key here is this. This gift of humility is a gift of freedom. It's a gift that allows me to begin connecting with other people who may even have differing opinions and allows me to start to see the world a little bit differently because it gives me the opportunity to have an identity exchange. There was an identity exchange that took place in, the, in that cab to, that day with both of us. I gave up the identity of having to be right and exchanged the identity to wanting to get it right in the words of Brene Brown, and so did he. Because you see, I have to make room in my heart to hear the rest of their story before we can connect and find ways to do things differently. So where does this leave us? As we go back here to the triangle of truth, 
when each of these elements of truth begin working synergistically, there is an infusion of wisdom. And wisdom is the art of living skillfully in whatever actual conditions we find ourselves. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna suggest that what the world needs now is someone, a leader, to step up who has the wisdom to skillfully end this truth or lack of truth and generate an opportunity to create truth in our corporations, in our families, in our country and in the world. Because here's the deal. When you know the truth, the truth sets you free. Thank you so much.